Okay, welcome back everybody to the 2022 Trailline Conference Day 4. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce my good friend Anish Sikri, top performer in the U.S. Investing Championship and also the head of the District IBD Meetup. He's going to give a really amazing presentation on uh, persistent trading, trading tactics, and market psychology, which I'm really looking forward to. Uh, Anish, thank you so much for being a part of this and, and welcome. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, everyone, uh, for attending today. I'm very happy that this conference is a big success. I am honored at the same time. There's so many amazing um, speakers that I'm associated with. So to me, that's pretty mind blowing. Um, I do want to thank you guys, the entire team, my family, my teachers, mentors, all the meetup members over the last decade and my beloved vets in believing in me. Um, I do want to thank God, the universe for throwing challenges at me and that helped me to push forward. And these key individuals on this list um, were at my start of my journey at the key critical moments uh, when I got to meet Mr. O'Neill, um, as everyone knows, Mark Minervini, Jack Schwager, Robin Sherma, Scott O'Neill, who is William O'Neill's son, who runs the uh, O'Neill Data Systems, Market Smith, our very own Scott Sinclair, Charles Harris, Mike Webster, Harold Morris, and thousands, I mean, hundreds of countless amazing people who I've met in my journey. Thank you guys, uh, the entire team at IBD and Marcus Smith uh, from the very day one, they were there. And uh, and to my new uh, friends at, uh, who I made at the 2020 USIC competition, uh, Shahid, Oliver, Matt, um, uh, Ryan, thank you guys. Um, and this one would be for Mark. Thank you, Mark, for uh, uh, coining the term nega toilets because those nega toilets, I'm using your term. I've cited your uh, work for the first time um, because I had a lot of nega, to uh, nega toilets in this journey, you know, but each, I mean, they helped, they gave me the incentive to go beyond my limits. So I think this is the first time I'm referencing uh, Mark's Urban Dictionary reference. So I think that should be pretty cool. All right. Okay. Just want to give a quick disclaimer. I'm not a um, training professional yet. I'm working on my Series 66. Um, but as of right now, me, Turtle Line team, everyone is not. Um, you want to talk about this disclaimer, uh, uh, Richard? Because we're not, uh, this is all educational uh, purposes yes. only. Absolutely. Everything is for educational purposes only. So perfect. Okay. I always start my meetups with Delbert, and this is the best. Dilbert, I can find on stock trading. So please enjoy. <laughs> I think it's spot on. I think it's spot on, on, on trading. So, all right. So I'm going to uh, give a quick bio. Everyone is wanting to know what I've done. Uh, I'll just, I don't like to talk about myself, but I'll just give a frame of reference where my background's in. Computer science. I worked at IBM in college. Post college, I was a corporate hacker for KPMG and Price uh, War uh, Coopers. Um, moving forward, I moved into the patent office. Uh, I examined patents. I couldn't trade at the patent office as much as I could because there was res um, restrictions um, based on the work I did. And, and obviously with KPMG and PwC, there were auditors for all these tech firms. I could never touch a stock, but I always wanted to use stocks. So um, those jobs are becoming an impediments to trading. Went full-time in 2012, went for a dream. Um, in the start of the dream, I wrote a book it's on Amazon and uh, Bill Gates got hold of it, listed on his blog. It's a sci-fi business leadership book. Uh, it shows my frame of mind at 2012. Today I'm much different but that's an early stage of my mind is in that book. Uh, I did manage family uh, trading accounts since my goal was to have a hedge fund. So I did manage other people's money, but it was family. Um, it comes with its own pressure. And I used the family accounts for the USIC 2020. So I was taking all kinds of pressure um, to trade uh, for the competition. And then uh, 2019, I moved into a leadership role managing a medical practice full time. And at the same time, I was doing the competition while seeing patients at the same time. So, um, and here we are at the present day. 
So any questions or Richard? This is a really quick uh, bio. No, I think that's good. I, I'm sure a lot of people want to know how you manage your time and everything, but I think you get into that later, right? Yeah, I want to get yeah. into that later. Perfect. Let's dive in. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to give a brief about the importance of these workshops that I've attended. Um, early in the career, um, up to 2014, was the Willem O'Neill era. I did the level one, two, three market school, level four masters at the last, I was at the last presentation for Willem O'Neill. Um, these workshops play a role, what you guys do at your line with all your, um, you know, the new courses you guys are coming up, they all play a role. Um, and and um, tactical, I mean, and a big, uh, you know, um, events that I've gone is Mark Minervini's master trader program twice and his private access also. Um, these, these um, all these things um, build into the tapestry of uh, trading experience. So these are, I highly advise people to go to workshops. Um, you guys are doing excellent work. You know, Mark has his own. I mean, just, you know, this is a constant um, educational uh, improvement. So uh, my general trading style, about my style is uh, 2008 up to 2014, I was trading strictly by the book, can Slim. I wasn't mixing anything else. Um, at that stage, um, initially my stops were at 8%, uh, but then as I gained some experience, it moved up to around 65%, um, but it was strictly by the book, everything by the book. Uh, 2017, uh, um, Mark enters the picture, uh, you know, when the student's ready, the teacher comes, uh, scenario happened. There's a big story behind how all that happened. Um, and then his incorporation of his VCP and SEPA methodology was incorporated on top of O'Neill's work. Um, and in the process, I've added um, elements from Stan Weinstein, uh, Paul Tudor Jones, Peter Brandt, Dan Zanger, and Peter Lynch into my stock analysis when I'm looking at all the pieces together. All right, today's agenda. Uh, I'm gonna talk about psychological aspects. I asked a question on Twitter about this. I'm gonna talk about, give you some ideas or strategies or something to think about on trade execution freeze, what happens to traders, trade fatigue, size issues, and then trade tactics for high performance. Uh, one of the key tools I use is the RS line angle strength, how to use Marcus Smith. And I'm gonna show some uh, 2020 trades that you guys can check on your own on um, using Marcus Smith, look at the back dates and see how the entries were done. The buy and stop entries are listed. And I can also give more, uh, I did so many trades. I, it's, it's insane amount of trades I did in 2020. Uh, time management strategies, some general time management strategies, how I use. And then uh, if you have time, if lots of slides, um, I will show a deep dive study I did on Palo Alto Networks. And um, it's gonna show a very big timeline how a stock moves and the market goes in a downtrend, how the market comes in an uptrend, how the stock um, starts to change its character, um, all of that. And it's a triple digit run on that uh, on that trade. So there's a lot of, um, if you get, uh, I hope I can get to it. It's, it's, it's lots of slides on that. And then Richard, just keep me posted on the time because there's um, we got a lot of images to go through today. Yep, we'll do. Okay. All right. Uh, any questions so far? Anything you want me to? No, I think uh, let's dive right in with with uh, these three big areas because I think that's that's something that I've seen a ton of questions about. So I'm interested to hear your take. Okay, so I'm uh, this presentation. I'm gonna try to um, make it as easy to understand. At the same time, it's gonna be very complex. So simplicity is the key here. I'm trying to be very simple. I'm gonna, trying to make it uh, at uh, it's clearer and Sesame Street level that I can because I think everybody knows I love uh, Sesame Street. But uh, simplicity is is the key here. On trade execution free of uh, um, freezes when it happens on the upside or the downside, and trade fatigue, it's a lot of traders are going through right now. And then size issues. The weakness in all of these areas actually stem from not having stops because you got to have stops. Uh, weakness and discipline and weakness in self-confidence. Now, because trading is all mental. Um, I know we can look at charts all day till the cows come home, but 
addressing these three elements, um, this is how you're going to trade well. You got to have stops. You got to work on your discipline and then work on your own self-confidence. Um, okay. On trade execution freeze. When you're not having stops in place, when placing a trade, you have to know where your stop is. You can't just randomly buy something. Let's say it's on Twitter or someone's talking about it. You, you know, you feel the, the FOMO coming in. You can't just buy it. Uh, even if you buy it randomly, you need to know where your stop is. Usually, if you don't, if you're not buying it right, your stop is also placed wrong. Um, so, you know, as they say in real estate, location is key, and same as it is in stocks. Location is key. Where are you placing your buy order, and where is the stop placed? Um, um, and you also have to plan for contingencies. Um, you know, um, Mark chapter talks about contingency planning. I'll bring a story about him. He's, this is his story. He had a space event. Um, I would say you ask him about it because he talks about it in the book, but there's a lot more to the picture. He lost his entire data feed. He drives to the broker and he's trying to figure out what happened. You know, did the market crash? In fact, the broker went down, the market was still active. So after that, he has, uh, you know, dual internet connections. Um, so do I, I have dual internet at my office. Um, you have to plan, you can't plan for everything, but the best thing you can do is put a stop as soon as you buy a position. That's the best thing you can do. As soon as you buy something, place a stop. And do not worry if it gets taken out because it's better to have that or have some catastrophic losses. Um, Matt Caruso and I were talking at the competition time about some Chinese stocks. Um, I actually had made prior year to the competition, I made 30% in one of these Chinese stocks. And I was like, okay, let me try this again. And I had a stop in place, but I didn't realize the risk I was putting in the competition with this type of a stock. And Matt told me, this is a story he's, he, he, I'm sure he's gonna bring it up. He's brought it up a few times. Uh, we were on Zoom call and the look on my face is because he says these, these stocks can go to zero. He was absolutely right. A week later, that stock went to zero or failed. I would have been a, it would have been a catastrophic hit at the competition because I had a position, size position on this trade. So I've also learned that whatever stocks you're buying, they can go to zero and you have to know how you're placing your size, what your stop is. That's the first step. You need to know where your stop is um, and how you plan your trade um, because things can go south in a moment's notice. Um, any questions, Richard? Anything? Good. No, I, th I think we're good. Okay. So I'm sure everyone's heard this or um, many times on Twitter or TV or, you know, Warren Buffett's rule on money. First rule, don't lose money. Second rule, don't forget first rule. It's kind of similar to the rules of Fight Club, but this is key here. You know, um, trade execution happens because there's a lot of, um, you haven't planned for, uh, it's like your eyes are, you know, like it's like a deer caught in a, in a car's headlights. You can't be in that situation. You have to have a game plan at all times. There's no other, I don't know how to simplify this. You got to have a stop. Okay, let's do some charts. Current, uh, current trade. Richard, uh, you have questions on this one? Let's, uh, I got animations on this. All right, let me do a pointer here. Okay. okay. All right, guys, we're going to do, I'm going to go through trade execution. How would you trade? How, what would you do with this trade? Now, people who have traded this, um, you know, just think about it. Where would you, Richard, where would you place a trade on this? I'd probably wait for it to establish a range uh, right near that, that low that it just set and, and tighten up a little bit and then look to, for it to make a significant higher low and then by the breakout from that range. Are we talking about this range or this range? Uh, down below where, where it's at right now. Or you could wait for it to push through 70 on heavy volume, but it, it'd be a little bit tougher to manage your risk once yeah. it's there. Yeah. Okay. That's great. That's actually, yeah, that's good. Um, let's say in this case, uh, it did break out in the daytime and it closed end of the day. You know, if you're using this, it's like a VCP here, you know, it's tightening up. 
Uh, let's see the next uh, slide. Let me show you what's going to happen next. Okay, there. It breaks that resistance on the top around $69, goes up. Heavy volume. You, you, you feel, Richard, that's a good entry? Yeah, uh, intraday, I definitely want to have spotted that volume run rate being higher and, and buy yeah. as close to that 70 mark as possible. Yep. Probably saying the stop at the low of the day or the low of the, yep. the day before. Yeah. Yep. Now, so in that case, see, you plan for that too. Okay. Like now it's going up. A trader's feeling great. Now it's coming down to retest where you bought. And this is where shakeouts happen. And uh, look at the five-day moving average. Now, what would a trader do at this point? Like, uh, in my, uh, what would you do, Richard? I'd probably be stopped out and probably yeah. as, it, as it pushed through that pivot and, and moved up, maybe you set your stop at, you know, either break even or, or move it up at, a little bit at least as it kind of makes progress for you. But I'd probably be stopped out at this point. Yeah. Same here. I would be too. If I was buying on this tight or low cheat area here, I would be stopped out because my exit would be right behind this low. Or if you bought it here, you definitely, it's down 7%. So obviously I will be stopped out too. Okay. But, but keep an eye on the RS line there. Yeah. Okay. So stocks acting up. Okay. Sitting there. All right. There. Now that's current. Now in this case, being caught on, you know, like if you didn't plan for this, that's your best exit. Your first exit is the best. You don't, we don't, no one knows how far it's going to go down. And in this case, it does go down. This is, this is now either seven, or this is even like, um, it's even lower. Like the percentage points are even lower. You're getting killed here. Yeah, it comes back up, but we don't know that in hindsight, you know, in the, in the, on the open, the stock was down. So, so trade execution on this one is just follow your stops. I wanted to give an example of just place your stop as soon as you buy a stock or sell into strength. And but that goes into more into your batting average, what your average gains are and what your average losses are. For me in this case, my average gain um, for the last two years, I'm doing about um, 10, 10%, stops around 3%, maybe 10, 12%. I'm going for the gains and I'm unloading the position. Not all of it. Sometimes all or sometimes half. In this case, the sector is hot. It's, uh, you know, three out of 197. So the sector is moving. So probably will take some off the table because at 30%, um, I'm, if I'm buying it here, I'm over 30% on profit. And and then keeping uh, raising my stop or or just just keep the original stop and then get stopped out and still have some profit. But, but this required planning and there was no trade execution freeze. But if you're new to trading and you get into this breakout and didn't really plan for this, but this is in two days. So you do have, uh, you know, contingency planning is involved in this because you don't know this can go down further. And it is down. I wouldn't be in this trade buying here and dealing with this. I won't be. Uh, and there's a, you think it's a good question that example? came in, Anish. Yeah. 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 So there's a question from FFTY. Um, Question, trade execution to buy right in this choppy environment. Any tips to build the patience and avoid uh, shakeouts? So look at the setups. In this case, I wasn't looking, I was just looking at the setup. This is a, you know, um, I would just focus on the quality of the setup if it's breaking out. I mean, I would care less. If, if I'm buying it right here, market could go down. It's not, I'm looking at this action. You know, and then I'm looking at this and and I hope that answers and have my stock in place. It's literally automatic for me. I'm actually at work when this is happening or right at 930 if it gaps down, you know, my stops executed. I'm just not at all stressed on this trade. Does that answer that question, Richard? I, I hope I answered it right. Yeah, I think it was more about, you know, knowing the environment and and whether you're going to decide to press it, take a lot of trades or, you know, hang back and be, be, be a little bit more I mean, patient. I mean, yeah. Okay. So if you're starting like fresh, I would be trading small right now, you know, a slowly incrementally increment, incrementing your size. Once you have traction in your portfolio, I wouldn't be hitting the gas. If you haven't like had a profit in your account the entire year, I would be like, okay, 
let me plan it out. Let me plan my, you know, if you watch my art of position sizing, I would plan the trade and go step by step till you get some profit in the account. Um, I wouldn't get greedy all of a sudden. I'm going to, you know, go, yeah, I'm going to, you know, hit the margin on this trade and go all in. I mean, you could do it, but then, you you know, you don't know where this is drop is going to happen. You know, this has happened in two days. I re think about it. A retail trader getting into this trade is excited. It was on Twitter. Everybody was talking about this. I saw this and everyone's more happy. Now, the markets, you know, you have to look at the S&P 500 in the back. You know, it's it's. You know, it's, it's trying to, you know, keep this, uh, trying to move up, but just look at the setup. Now this happens. All right, it's testing. Okay, but now this is immediate. So um, if a lot of stocks are doing this, you have to plan, um, you have to trade small, you know, till you get some profit. I hope that answers it. Yeah, I think it does. All right, now trade execution. We're gonna, I was gonna move into this. What would you do with this trade? Okay, now, this is the oil and gas uh, stocks. You know, these were, look at these rocket ship moves here. I mean, look at that. This almost uh, doubled. It's almost doubled here, you know? It did double uh, in a short time frame. Richard, what would you do on this now? Yeah, it, it's tough because uh, pullback buys aren't my, aren't my cup of tea. Uh, but if I'm buying off the pullback to the 50 day, I'd set my stop just below that moving average. Yep. Yeah. That's how I would do it. But let's say you didn't do this trick. Let, yeah. Let's say you skip this, you know, one way is to really, you have to be on top of this. And usually on the day when this is happening, the moving average is not going to be exactly touching it because yeah. you have further data. That's why it's getting close. So there's going to be a little bit of lag in there because moving averages are a lag. Now, in this case, let's look at the RS line because we're gonna, these topics are gonna come later. So, okay, let's say I go a few days out. Now, let's say you see this pattern forming. How would you trade this now? It's still not super tight. Uh, honestly, I'd probably wait for a little bit more tightness, but you could also buy through the highs of that range or the high yes. of that red, red candle. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So this is the way I would be trading is would be if I didn't get this and I saw this uh, power move up here, you know, there's 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 definitely, OK, you know, all right, support on volume here on the 50 day moving average. I would be doing a horizontal line right here. And if it pops from it, I would be buying it. And I go two days forward. So, you know, you buy it on that day and you go up. My stop would be right around here. OK. Uh, now let's see what happens. Now the RS line has jumped up. Yep. Immediately, it's as soon as it breaks out, it's it's you know it's like I don't like to see this, you know. But you know it happens in this market environment. Okay, it's hanging in there. RS is actually going up, but look at the volume. It's kind of like dropping off. I'm looking at all these factors at, at the same time. All right. The trade's going well because now, you know, if you bought it around like, what is this, like 38 and you're up uh, eight, nine. Yeah, I'm up probably up 10% because this is 8% move. All right, that's a pretty good trade. Now, based on my batting average, I would be either reducing half the position, moving the stop up. So I don't like to round trip a, a profitable trade. Um, on the average, let's say a stock goes up 10%, I sell half. I actually move the stop up pretty much to at 5%. So whatever happens, I take something. I don't, um, now based on the environment, you know, I move the stops, but uh, once profit's there, uh, I like to keep it. This is what I learned from Mark. Um, all right, so the rest of the position is going up a few days out. This is on July 15th, uh, I think. No, no, not July 15th yet. All right, now, it's still hanging up there. It's trying to pass that round number fifty dollars. It's now. Can you tell there's a resistance there, Richard? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So there we go. Now you, as a trader, you cannot. You have to be always thinking of. Um, you can't be. Um, you know. You can't be frozen here. Is Looking at the five-day moving average, uh, I think it's the 
yeah, five day moving average or 10 day moving average. Uh, yes, 10 day moving average. So it's, there's definitely resistance at 50 and you bought it here. You have to think about what the environment is, the market's down, this is going up. You do have to lock profits. It's just the, the nature of the environment. Because if you don't, this is what's happening. It's going sideways. But look at the volume. Look at this. We have this heavy red volume right here while it's moving up. So somebody was unloading it while it's moving up. Then all of a sudden, you have no volume coming in. And look at the price action. Yeah, RS is up, market's down. But this volume, you know, is, it's showing you something's going on here. Now, this is a weekly chart. You actually have a uh, stalling action happening on a weekly chart because this is a red bar here and this price for the price action didn't move. This is in William O'Neill's book. So you have to kind of read what happened a week before because this is the current week you're in right now. And this is on, this is actually sync date to date. Um, on, this is Friday's action of uh, May 10th. This is also May 10th on the weekly chart or 6th 10th, um, I think 6th 10th. It's, yeah, it's exact. So, but you have to figure out this uh, stalling action. And there you have a change of character on the 21 day moving average. You didn't unload or reduce. This is what happens. This is a 9% drop in one day. It pierces the 50 day. The entire move, it finally pierces the 50 day. And then, you know, you're even down further. So I think this is like more than 40% down. So things change really fast. You have to have your stops in place. You cannot, you cannot forever things is going to go up because you have this change of character happening. It's very subtle. It's very subtle. And seeing how um, a stalling action is happening while the RS is up and the market's down, there's, there's people are sitting here. It's very subtle, but that's the art of trading. I mean, it takes, you have to go through charts to see that. Any questions on that, Richard? No, I think noticing those changing characters, I think is really key. And and you saw how it was respecting the 10 day moving average. If you can go yeah. back one one slide, even during yeah. the prior run up before this base, yep, it was right respecting there. it. And then it it, it leaks below that uh, before yep. the most recent pullback. So, yep. so that's yeah. the characteristic of the stock. You want mm -hmm. it to be right above it and you need to be out. So that's good observation, Richard. Excellent. Thanks. Okay. So trade fatigue. Uh, over trading, falling in love with pet stocks, BTFT trades. Uh, I'll be a professional here, so I won't explain what that means, but Richard, you can say it. YOLO trades, uh, seeing patterns where patterns do not exist. This is mentioned in Jack Schreiber's Market Wizards books. Uh, one of the Market Wizards he's interviewing talks about it. I do apologize, I can't remember whose name it is, but it's in the books. Um, because the psychological aspects on trade fatigues are this. Here's what's happening in a trader's person who's right now in this current environment having a high probability is what's happening in the account and the trader's mind. Losses are piling up. Equity curve is pointing down. Frustrations are creeping in. Surfing the net to find some validation on a trade because people will you know, try to find anything on Twitter, Google, whatever, trying to confirm what they are buying. Angry with family and friends, bad to home habits forming, like getting drunk every day, you know, just every bad habit you can imagine, you know, it's, they start to creep in, small, it comes slowly, can't sleep well at night, going on Twitter, giving good traders a hard time, you know, like going on Mark's uh, Twitter feed and giving a hard time to Oliver, you know, all these guys, they always, uh, I feel bad for them because they have to deal with it sometimes, you know, and then the person is becoming a negative, negative toilet formation is coming. Positions may have stops, but a trader wants to revenge trade the same stock because of falling in love with the same stock. And then positions may have no stops. Yet. I have gone through this. Uh, the only reason I can say this is because I've gone through this. Um, and this is where trade fatigue kicks in um, because your state or your mental state is totally um, not in sync. Um, think about it. If you're making profit, you really have trade fatigue. Would you have trade fatigue, Richard, if you're just going after profit after profit? Uh, maybe a little, but definitely not as much if you're getting positive feedback. Yeah, and, positive yeah. feedback, yeah. yeah. So these things are, are like, um, are, are 
I would go, I would say, result of the actions a trader is doing on this, these are the results. Um, because I get calls all the time, you know, I get calls when, um, you know, persons are defending their position and they're already down 40%. This is exactly what's happening. They're defending a position, not having, um, you know, the, the stops in, not buying it right, uh, falling in love with the stock, the story. Um, in the end of the day, you have to see what the chart's doing and what the stock is doing. So I'll give you a good example of myself. And 2014 was a significant year on my tactical trading. It was, uh, this is before Minervini era uh, comes in. Uh, this is the O'Neill era in, in my, if I had to give a timeline of my trades. Um, I did insane performance in 2014. I wish USIC was there at that time. Anyway, so I bought Juliet Air in August and rode this trade up. And this was a really uh, aggressive move all the way. After that, I moved into Alibaba, GoPro, a um, bunch of other trades. Then I came back to this trade in around January. This time, I'm just like, I want to make this return just like this. Uh, it's based on what I achieved in 2014. So my mind was warped. I'm trading between this, totally seeing patterns that don't really exist. And in this entire chart, it was, it was a total total epic loss. Epic win on one side, a few months later, epic loss. And totally missed this. Now, looking back, I can see a tightening up here, VCP, you can buy this, you can, you know, buy it right of this resistance, takes off, totally missed this. But I got chopped around because I fell in love with the stock. I was going through all of this, you know? So I didn't do this. I didn't do this. I was on a Twitter and I wasn't, you know, but this was happening. So, you can't fall in love with the story. You have to look at proper setups. You have to be objective. You can't be attached to a trade. Detachment from a trade is mandatory. It's just, you know, we, this has all happened in, um, I had ultra high triple digit performance in 2014, ultra high. In 2015 was a total disaster because I fell in love with the stock. Any questions on that, Richard? There's a question in the chat um, about kind of your period before you found uh, Mark in the VCB style. Uh, question for Anish, having followed Cantsum by the book for so many years, uh, did he incorporate any other concepts on top to fix any specific problems? Uh, could you elaborate that more? Yeah, I think he's asking basically, how did you adapt your style after being a strict Cantsum type trader? How, how did you adapt your entries, your exit, all of that, so it, it more suited kind of your personality and, and your system? Um. That question is about to come. Can you hold on? Hold on to that. Can you come yeah. back? Oh, there's a slide on that. Perfect. So, okay. Just hold. Just make sure we answer that question. Okay. Now I want to talk about size issues. A lot of people don't address this. This is this is I think a very uh, un um, under addressed topic. Majority of new traders believe that one needs big size to make money. Do you agree, uh, Richard, or, or do you agree with that statement? Yeah, I was talking with uh, Tom Basso yesterday and he, he said, you know, everybody comes in, they, they want to make so much money, they size up huge. But if you don't have a logic and a reason bef behind your sizing, it's going to lead to some type of problem. You're either going to not perform well enough because you're undersizing or you're oversizing when you shouldn't be. And it's going to lead to blow ups. It's going to lead to big losses, all of that. So yeah, I 100%, you, you have to have a system around this. That That's super important. Yeah, you answered it really well. You yeah. actually answered it really well. I mean, and you said the same. You can't just have come in with big money to make money. You can start with a small account, and then you can make you know huge, huge returns. Um, but you have to have a system and process, and and you know trade step by step. So small account um, has a tactical advantage when you're when you're new to trading, because you can get out faster than anyone else. Because that's the key. When things are about to go south, you need, you want to be the first one out, not the last one out. Focus on the process, and the rest will take care of itself. Um, you know, for a lot of traders, people think, oh, if I had a million dollars trading, you know, but let's say you get into a trade um, and the average, you know, the volume is not hot, big enough, but you can get in. Oh, uh, brokers will take your shares. You're, you're, you will be the volume on that day. But if you didn't get out when the selling happens, you can have, um, you can lose a million dollars so fast. Um, 
and it gets worse if you start doing option trading on top of it. Um, so it's the process, as you said, is the key, you know, and, and, and these things should not matter. Yeah, for uh, for swing trading, you need a margin account minimum, you know, so there's some SEC restrictions on that. So talk to your broker. I can't give advice on that. Um, okay. Okay, issues with large accounts. If you're new to trading, haven't really made a profit in trading and you're starting with a large account, chances are your account's way too big for you to mentally handle the drawdowns. Uh, for example, you know, someone says, I wanna go into trading, I'm gonna put 100K in an account, but are scared to lose 5%. And in that case, that'd be 5% drawdown. You're trading, that, that trader is trading way over his or her sleeping point because if think about this, you want to, every trader wants to make money, but it doesn't matter where you start up, but let's say someone comes in with a large amount, have never traded the psychological aspects of seeing 5K go up and down in a day. On some of these stocks, let's say you had the previous stock, EQT, it dropped 9%. In that case, let's say it dropped 10%, you would be at 10K, uh, you know, loss. I'm not saying the entire account's on one position, but I'm just, you know, giving an example here. Uh, Okay, now let's say this happens, you get lucky and you, your stock gets bought out when a new drug gets announced. Now your account overnight is up 50%, 100% in one shot. And you know, you could get lucky or some stock tip on Twitter or Reddit, or, you know, got something. And you're all of a sudden, you're seeing, experiencing large money for the first time you've ever seen. And um, for some traders seeing large um, immediate, you know, your account gets large, it increases fear of trading because now you're like scared to lose money or you're going to trade aggressively because you want to be, you want to make more. And then you're executing large trades um, with bad um, stops because greed has increased exponentially. This actually happened to me. Um, you know, um, I actually went through this um, and I've seen other traders. Um, I've seen on the other side, traders freeze because their account's so big and they can't even move. They can't even handle um, you know, a few, a few, few thousand dollars down on a really, um, you know, tactfully uh, large accounts, and they can't even move that account. On on a two percent drawdown, they can't have. Um, when I was managing uh, family money, um, my uh, the persons who I was managing couldn't handle a five percent drawdown. Uh, just couldn't handle it. I would get a phone call saying, oh, why is this a 5% drawdown? I'm like, 5%? That's on one position, not the entire account. They just couldn't handle it. Um, so, And I was using this at the competitions. I had to be at a very tight the entire time. The whole point was to not lose anything on the equity curve. Um, talk about pressure. So it's and when you're in this situation, it is imperative to take profits out of the account and come back to a comfortable sleeping point. A trader must wrestle with fear and greed. Risk management on the upside is as important as managing on the downside. Um, I, I, does it help, Richard? Any questions on this? No, I think that's good. Good. Okay. Okay. So now there's key solution to these th three psychological aspects that we discussed earlier. This may sound very simple, but it's not. This one's going to take work because you do have to build your own self-confidence. And this is in all areas of life, not just one area of life in trading. It just, it doesn't work that way. It's a 24 seven game um, because I'm gonna quote Jim Rohn, uh, um, who did, I encountered him in 2015. Well, he passed away by then, but his works came in 2015 for me. Think about this. The greatest step towards success is self-confidence. The greatest builder of self-confidence is self-esteem and self-esteem comes from doing the daily things you should do your self-esteem will start to soar when you make some critical decisions decisions to walk a new road start a new direction to start a new discipline you do need self-confidence um, in order to address those three psychological uh, elements one of the key uh, easy things i would suggest not easy but very effective ways is i um i came across this i actually did a trade to pay for this uh, in 2015 uh, just because I needed this really bad. And it was uh, one of the most, uh, just before I met Mark, this was the things happening. 
Um, I, you know, Jim Rohn's Foundation of Success is a very big module. He mentored Tony Robbins. Um, so he's the mentor to the masters. Tons of other people he's mentored. Excellent. Uh, um, it's insane amount of videos, his workshops, everything's there. Uh, it's all recorded because he's, you know, he passed away in 2011. Uh, but um, this is the website, successacademy.com. Um, and then in my journey, I came across these two gentlemen. Um, I met Robin Sharma in 2013. Um, um, I actually went to a conference uh, where I was the second youngest guy there. And it's a room full of about 50 people. And at least there were 10 billionaires there. I didn't even know who the billionaires were. Um, so I learned about leadership with him. And then uh, moving forward, I got introduced to Darren Hardy's work uh, because I imply, um, employ all their strategies at my own practice, you know, when I'm seeing patients and managing employees, because the, the L of can slim applies to you also. It's not just on the best stocks. If you want to get the best stocks, you have to think like a leader also. Uh, you have to think fast you can't you have to ex it's all about execution you can't be um you know when like um i haven't you know like when covid uh when omicron hit i had no staff i had to think out of out of the box how do i handle this when i'm at the competition at the usic i was seeing patients all day but i had to think of getting supplies i had to you know you have to be on top of things you can't you can't you know uh be procrastinate at that time so a lot of other qualities that I had to learn um, after my 2015 to 2017 era is very unique. And in those years, I was learning about all this because you have to improve yourself if you want to be a very good stock trader. Any questions on this, Richard? No, I think that's a really good mes message. I know this may sound easy, but this is not. This is the hardest part as a trader because your mind has to change. Uh, these two books are critical. I would say uh, every entrepreneur out there has Think and Grow Rich. I even have a signed copy from Mr. Hill. Um, and then Mindset Secrets of Winning. This is a phenomenal book Mark has written. I wish, he, I wish this book was written uh, around my 2015 uh, to 2017 era. You know, it came later, but oh, what a fantastic book. Uh, I think everyone can tell how much, uh, you know, Mark's fanboy I am, I am too. <laughs> But no, the work is it speaks for itself. Okay. Okay. So there are there is a cycle that I came up with uh, over the years from my looking at my meetup groups and the other meetup groups in the area, and I've met a lot of traders at conferences and stuff. There are these uh, four things if you want high performance. Number one, you gotta have a positive mindset, and that comes feedback loop comes from doing the work doing the charts, reading, you know, books, studying, you have to do the work. There's no, there's no, there's no shortcuts. And then the, then after you learn the theory, you have to execute the trade. You have to execute, you gotta place your stops in. It, it's, it's a process. Everyone is different. There's no cookie cutter. You can become this. No, I can't be Mark. Mark can't be me, but, but I am learning from him evolving on my own style. Same thing as I evolved from learning from William O'Neill's works. Um, and then when, then you get a trade feedback loop, you know, well, how the trade does good or bad. And that goes back to your positive mindset. If you have a positive mindset, you can handle those losses and you can be like, all right, let me figure this out. Let me improve my, um, improve the process. Keep improving the process till you get it right. To get triple digit trading, you're not going to get it in one shot. Let's say um, up to 2014, a big rule that I followed was Bill and Moniel said, you have to be 2X the stock market return. Let's say the entire market uh, from January 1st to December 31st goes up 20% with all the ups and downs and it closes the year with 20%. Just by doing can slim, you should be able to do at least 2x, uh, 40% at least. Uh, people say it's impossible. No, if you just read the books, the patterns are there. The work, the tools are there. Not executing the tools right, um, you know, a messes up the positive mindset. Um, I mean, so it's a feedback loop. Okay, so I have a list of books here. I'm sure there's a lot of books I've posted on Twitter. Mox posted it. Just these books, everyone should have re read. If you haven't read, I would read definitely all these books. All of Jack Schwager's Market Visitors. I didn't put all the covers. John Boyk's, all his uh, books are excellent. Uh, Mark's books, all four of his books are there. Mark Douglas has few extra books after trading in the zone. That's excellent. Classic, Just Deliver More. 
The Perfect Speculator is a fantastic underrated book. If you pull up uh, Taser uh, stock on Market Smith, um, what's the ticker for Taser now, uh, Richard? Do you know? It's, it's not T A Z R, is it? It's A X O N, I, I think. Yeah. yeah. Either A X O N. Pull up this book, check page by page, pull up the chart, and go on Market Smith one by one, bar by bar. See how the professionals and the insiders are selling the stock and riding the entire wave. Well, just by doing that exercise with this book, transform my performance, I was able to make 100% easily right off the bat from, you know, all these books combined, but that book is key. And obviously very famous, Nicholas Darvis is how I made $2 million in the stock market, epic book. Uh, you gotta read, and I expect the people for this conference have read all these books, you know, if not have to read all these books, the entire Jack Schwager's Market Visit series and, and the entire his series, because I didn't put all their pictures in. So this is a lot of work. But uh, you can see how these, you know, and, and apparently you guys are doing Stan Weinstein's uh, workshop. It's so cool. You, 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 you got him come out of the, from behind the scenes, Richard. I think you guys are pretty cool for that. <laughs> yeah, it should be pretty fun. I've got an interview just uh, on Monday with him about, uh, you know, his entry tactics. So I'm really looking forward to asking him like 40 plus questions. So it should be fun. Yeah. Thanks. All right. So now we're going to switch gears. I'm going from the psychological mental state. Any questions on that before going to tactics? This is no. going to be right technical. I think we're good. Okay. So part of my tactics, there's a lot of material. I can't put all in this one presentation, but I'm going to put some, some interesting ones for everyone to learn. And the first one, this part of the presentation is extremely heavily inspired by Marcus Smith, Scott Sinclair. Uh, it's the credit goes to him and his team for this, William O'Neill's team. Uh, this is, I was inspired by his presentation when I was at the level four with uh, Willem O'Neill in 2014. Um, this material is taken from that experience and insights. So please, if you want to give a shout out to Scott on Twitter, follow him. He's an excellent trader. He plays a, he has played a critical role in my growth uh, as a stock trader and the entire team at Mark Smith. So love you guys, you know, excellent. All right. All right. So RS line, there is an art to this. You do need a positive state of mind because you have to see the nuances of the RS line in downturn market, especially like we are in right now. This is this is where the magic happens. In fact, these are e the trades get easier because these are the stocks which are trying to push forward. And the recurrent example in this market was BLTE. You know, I got uh, I think I posted on Twitter thirty percent in three days. Another trade on it, a very very quick trade. It's like seven, another seven percent on it. Um, this RS line was rocket shit, and how you perceive can make or break your trade. So, quick insights. Excuse me. <laughs> um, I learned from the conference not to use the term bull and bears. Uh, use the phrase uptrend and downtrend, just like the newspaper says, because bulls and bears can distort your market psychology. For me, I would say, oh, cuddly bear, you know. Like teddy bear, we need the poo, but it's okay. I'm, I'm a kid at heart. But uh, understanding what the market is, the uptrend or downtrend, because everything is how you think is everything. Because, because if it's downtrend, I mean, there are times I'm shorting all the time. So at that point, I want the market to be a downtrend if I'm shorting. So, but I'm not going to cover shorting today. That's a completely our multi hour conversation on that one. But let's focus on a few things here. Richard, am I doing good? Yeah, all good. Yeah. All right. All right. What is it? Uh, it is a stock's relative strength line compares to stock's price performance versus the S&P 500 index. The line is derived by dividing the stock price by S&P 500 index value. An upward sloping line means the stock price is outperforming the index. Now, Marcus Smith had an update. You can change that to an index like NASDAQ, which I like to do that. But the, all the below examples use S&P 500. You can just leave it at S&P 500 and that's fine too. Uh, sometimes I get very aggressive. I wanna use NASDAQ, but for years um, I've used S&P 500. That's the way default setting was and it worked. So there's nothing wrong with it. Okay. But you do, there are requirements to RS line. Just looking at a line without it is is absolutely, you're not going to get, um, you're going to misinterpret the whole thing. Um, you do have to understand all the books by Bill O'Neill and Mark, what bases are, 
and what the stock is in, what stage it's in, you know, stage one, stage two, is it a basing period? You have to understand that. The more charts you look, the better you become. And I would say stick to Market Smith. It's, it lays out really well. I don't know about the third party uh, other charts like I don't know the RS line in TC2000. I know Richard has more experience in it. How is it, Richard, on TC2000 RS line? I don't really use that feature on it. Yeah, I I think it's pretty much the same. I don't I don't know. It's a, a huge difference. Maybe somebody who's used Market Smith for years, you're kind of used to that. But I I think okay. the TC2000 one's pretty effective. Okay, is the same good on trading uh, trading view also? Because we have people using trading view TC2000. Yeah, I, I think it's similar. It might be a little bit squished up in the you know upper panel, but I think it's fine. Okay. Okay, so benefits of RS line, they do help detect before they break out. And it's also good as a portfolio management tool. Okay, so these are the six shades of RS line types. Greg goes to Scott Sinclair. There is an angle of ascent on RS line, RS line new high before price, RS line confirmation, RS line non-confirmation, RS line positive divergences, and RS line negative divergences. I'm gonna go through all of these six elements okay for angle of ascent um if you have a standard clock or a watch the rs line on the chart should be between you know imagine there's a clock there you put a clock there it should be the line should be pointing towards 12 o'clock or two o'clock this is this is for the best stocks look at the current example of that stock blte before it broke out it was literally at 12 o'clock um you also want to pay attention to the rs line change of characters very subtle like in the previous examples of this presentation, if you would, you know, when the replay is there, you go back, play, look at the EQT, uh, the chart I did, look at the RS line chain and character on that stock. It went from up to down. Um, an RS line can act to guide about strength of your stock and you're not sure about the base. I'm gonna have charts right after this. So it will make all sense. So these are some old charts, but uh, they're properly annotated because I was looking at this. Now this is everyone's, uh, you know, everybody wanted Facebook. This is the IPO where everybody was getting two shares for one from brokers. So public got sold into this. Professionals were buying here because you had a 30% move here. There we go. You had a positive move up, comes down, makes a base. Everyone's worn out because people got killed over here. Retail, it's all retail because somebody had to unload. But look at the RS line is going down, but the market's up in an uptrend. Excellent double bottom with a 30% prior uptrend. So just because the stock looks here, you have to see what the picture is, what it's doing here. This is a 30% uptrend move. It is correcting in an uptrending market. So the market's up, but this stock's not ready yet. But the RS line is 100% lagging the S&P 500. And this makes Facebook a lagger stock at this point. And it's one week before earnings. And this is a weekly chart. And you have massive double bottom base breakout on earnings. You know, playing earnings, uh, playing a trade, if you don't have profit going into earnings, I don't do that anymore. Um, if I, I would ride the earnings if I have at least minimum 10% profit and I would actually sell half and at least have some profit, but I need to have cushion in the account if I'm gonna ride to earnings. But look at the RS line character, it became at 12 o'clock. Right here, it's low, and then all of a sudden it jumps up. Right, pop this. Look at that volume right there. Let's go and stock goes up. Weekly chart, 67% before the next base starts. This is the next base. Now, as I've learned from uh, address that question, how I involved Mark Vinarini style on top of O'Neill. Let's say I missed this. I would be buying it here. Let's say I didn't get that. I would be buying at this resistance right here at 34. I would be buying it at this powerful breakout. I would actually buy it at the top. On a day chart, I'm sure there's a pattern there, like a very high tight flag. I would be buying it right after the earnings. That's how I would play it. Based on this insane volume here, I would be, that's a very powerful move. If not, I would be buying a resistance at around $40 and buying that up. But not, I, I wouldn't be buying it here because that's chasing it. But I would be looking at this base. If I didn't get it here, I would be looking here. Um, resistance of the old prior high right from here. And look at the RS line. It's also going up. Okay. 
now I'm going to put this, uh, I'm, I'm going to take to a stock before I was even born. Look at Intel. The RS line is up before the price is, and the market is in a 15% correction. It doesn't matter what time period, but the patterns come, go back in time, it's always the same. Isn't that fascinating, Richard? Yeah, this is this is something, this is a characteristic that Ross, you know, talks about all the time, the relative yeah. strength line leading the price, making new yep. highs, either, you know, all-time highs, or even he looks at, you know, a pivot point, and if the relative strength line has already broken out before the price does through that same pivot point area, that's something he really keys in on. So th this is super important. I would be so aggressive on that pivot right there, low cheek area right there. I would be aggressively buying it just because I know this is leading. Oh, you, you, know, you stock set up before the market does. This is this is a huge shift I got from Mark. Because I don't even look at the indexes. At, I don't even look at the indexes. I just look at the setup. Um, I mean, you can even... You know, say you could do that trade. I'm just moving the mouse because I have more experience now. When I'm, you know, when I was, when I did, this is from my um, model books. These, these, these charts. Now I'm like, I, I visit these all the time, and I was like, oh, let me look at this pattern. If I didn't, if I remove this day, this looks like a traditional stock even for today's market. You, you know, there's so many stocks like this. Uh, so, there you have it. RS line goes 34% from the first base. Second base comes, pivot, 50-day bounce. That's a 10-week moving average, so you would just buy it. 29% from the second base, 74% from the first base. This is how you get high-performing trading. When you observe the RS line, corrector change, um, and the stock is there. You have to put all these pieces together. There are some... Um, for homework, if you guys want to do this, uh, I would highly suggest use Marcus Smith on this because you can go on the dates. Um, I know uh, PlayStation can go that far. Your paid, uh, paid charting tools can go that far. Uh, study Amazon weekly chart, 3-12-2009, and then 12-18-2009. This, the reason I choose 2009 is because this is coming out um, because the bull market's about to start. And it started around uh, 3 15 these stocks were coming before the actions. Uh, and um, same with NTS, and uh, I never can pronounce this. NTS, NTS, I call it NTS. What do you call it, Richard? Yeah, I would just spell it out, I think. N -T -N -E -N -T -E -S. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, now we're going to talk about RS line confirmation. On this case, you already see the breakout happens. The RS line is going to be high grounds. This is, I actually did trade this. Uh, this is the trade I did on Thames. I missed it, but I saw this trade. RS line coming, breaks out. Literally, I was buying in that pivot right there. Actually, no, right in this pivot. Horizontal line right there. Uh, because this is before Scott O'Neill came to the meetup event, right there. Uh, because I missed this, but but look at the RS line is is telling me power, and this goes up, it just goes up. Uh, so there's multiple entry points you can do it, and look a change of character happens about this term. So the RS line breakout. Look at the RS line. The, the, this is where the this is where the power is. These are the stocks you want to get. You need to get them as soon as they happen. You can't. You don't want to be like, oh, I missed it. Yeah, there are other entry points, but your slippage happens. Let's say these people who bought it here, they get shaken out on this week right there. You know, let's say you bought it right here when it's obvious, you get shaken out. And guess what? Now you're holding the bag here. Now the whole, you know, the mental fatigue kicks in because uh, as a trader, you'll think I miss this entire move. Go to the next stock. The RS line also changes character. You could actually draw it on a straight line here and it breaks. That's, you know, uh, your exit. Um, all right, uh, solar winds. Um, so this is very interesting. The price is trying to move up. Volume is dropping, but the RS line is not climbing. Stage four base. You know, this is, if you think about it, look, stage two, you know, comes air, goes up, it's riding now, it's becoming as technically moving averages. So it's stage three, but it's stage four base on Marcus Smith count. But I'm just looking at the trend of the stock. It's on stage three right now on uh, Stan Weinstein or Mark Minervini in last week's stage three. 
Uh, but look at the RS line right there. Couldn't climb, price goes up, but the RS line could not uh, climb, and there you go. 45% um, drop, you know. Stocks making all time high here, but the RS line couldn't even climb up. Any questions on that, Richard? No, I, I think that's clear. All right, now this is your advanced trading tactics. Positive divergence, I use exploit this. I, if I get to see this, I am exploiting this if I can. Now in this case, you'll have a shakeout, but the RS line does not make a new low. This is very subtle. You can't just look here and there. There is key points. Yeah, you can say it right there too. It's characteristic, it's, it's doing the same thing, but it's very sharp shakeout, but the RS line didn't come. It's it's the velocity of the shakeout and the po uh, positive divergence isn't uh, coming down. That's that's key. You see, I mean, you would see it, oh, it's doing it here. No, it's, look, on this velocity drop right there, the RS line does go down. On this velocity drop down, look, it's uh, took out all these, eight, um, all these, um, you know, it was on the newspaper, everyone's buying it, getting churned up, got taken out, but the RS line did not come down. Now, when the stock tries to recover, I'm trying to get back into a stock when it's recovered. You know, there's, I can go on more tactics, but I would be like, you know, just buy above this. There's, there's ways to trade around this too, but I'm gonna. There's there's stacking, so you can do a pivot right there, for a stop right there, and move. But that's you got to be really sure on that type of trade. I wouldn't really trade when it's below 50 day when it's moved like this. I would wait for it to climb back up, or tighten up here, and then go back up here. So you would want to see this, and it's gonna go sideways here, and then take it. And that's how I would be properly buying it. You don't want to buy wrong, um, but you do want to see this is a very powerful um, indicator that stock will move up because. As I said, comes right up here, takes off 20% in a few short days. Can't beat that. Good chart, right, Richard? Yeah, absolutely. That was sell gene. And biotechs do move really fast. Um, okay. There are two examples here BGRI. Um, when you play this replay video, you guys can just pause it on this screen and then pull up the charts, study NVR and BGRI. These are the dates. Uh, there's two charts. We have uh, October 1st, 2010, uh, July 22nd, 2011, uh, October 12th, 2001, and May 31st, 2002. So I want to go give you guys something, you know, what happens in the past happens in the present moment too. Now, this is where um, laggards happen, negative divergences. Um, you will always see the RS line is uh, trailing down faster before the stock price can. It usually goes down. Um, you know, these are the stocks that you should be, you know, if you've got advanced skill, you'll be shorting it right there. But you have to time it right. Shorting is not like something you place a position in. You have to time it right because brokers see your position and you're shorting because you have to uh, borrow the stock. So, short. Um, if it's not a setup, don't trade. You know, uh, negative divergences. I found one stock uh, from my model book, uh, and this is one of them. All right. So to that question of the person who asked how Mark's Minerini tactics evolved, um, when I met Mark in 2017 at a meetup event, I uh, ended up asking for uh, when we actually went out to dinner after that. Uh, we talked about every other book besides stock books. So Thinking Grow Rich was the first book we talked about. Um, what I learned from him is he analyzed me. He knew where my, I wasn't, I was very close on managing my risk properly, but I wasn't right there yet. I was like right on the cusp of figuring it out. And, and this is where the catapult happened. Uh, when I realized where I can take very aggressive positions, manage my risk really well, keep my stops even tighter. Uh, and this is on top of O'Neill's work. So it was very, because his work is built on, you know, O'Neill, he's the he, he's the greatest of all time. Um, and so I was able to incorporate Mark's trading uh, discipline tactics, because he's extremely disciplined. And I needed a disciplined teacher at that time. Um, and seeing him, 
in action in real time how we trade um, accelerated my course. Um, I don't know if Mark would ever show it. On 2018, I'm at a conference. I'm asking him a question. He actually captured my aha moment. Um, I'm sure that the, his, his crew was there. Uh, I was, of course, on the mic. Um, and I asked him with his influence, could he bring this feature on the stock chart? And he said that would hold me back because, and, and that was a very big aha moment because I just need to look at the stock. I just need to look at the, the price patterns itself. I don't need to focus on other a secondary or third indicators. And that was holding me back actually. Um, so my evolution really did happen on top of one year's work with going to the master trade program. Second time was even better because first time it was overwhelming, it's a fire hose. Second time, a lot of things connected to the dots. It was last year. Uh, okay, market submit. This is how I use market submit. Um, I've highlighted uh, the areas that I look, the blue ones I go first, and then the green one, in the section I go is my secondary list. I browse it later. Uh, since my time is extremely short, the stocks I buy has to, be in these, uh, has to be in these lists. If it's not in this list, I'm not even wasting time. Um, I do filter it out, uh, grow to 50. If a stock shows up in multiple lists, usually it's the one that I'm buying. But I'm gonna show you some of the qualities that I'm looking at on these variables. So these are the areas that I look at. I think I mentioned this on Twitter too. These are the areas I go through based on my time horizon. I just, I need speed. I need to go through charts really fast. Uh, if you have time, I would go through market spend really fast. How I look at things, you can do that too. Uh, keep that in mind, Richard. Any questions coming in? There's some good questions, but uh, they're, they're not super relevant to what you're going through right now. So I'll, I'll hold them off for that. Okay. Yep. okay. Did I answer that person's question about uh, employing tactics from Mark uh, on top of when he was work? Did I answer that question? Yeah, I, I think you did. Okay, so um, the list is big. So out of that, there's a few more lists. I look at the bottom. I wish they had sector leaders from the newspaper. That's the only list which is not on Marcus Smith. And I love, love that list. The sector leaders at IBD newspaper. That is a very, uh, at times it's an ultra aggressive list. Um, it's the best of the best, very aggressive stocks, and it's very tight filter. I do like that. If it's on the weekly newspaper. You should be able to see the sector leaders. Um, but I do go through this um, when I have time, but the, the list on the top is the first one I go. Uh, accelerating leaders, and I, you know, I do browse industry groups because the deep dive that I'm about to show does show how the changes in the industry groups and the stocks uh, characteristics, of all, they all dance around each other. All right, some of these variables that I absolutely pay attention to on Marcus Smith is the up-down volume ratio. I need it to be over 1.1 or higher. Higher, the better. If it's two, even two or three, I'm on it. Uh, comp rating, I want this to be high because even if the EPS is a little bit lower, I want the comp to be always be higher. Uh, 70 is my minimum. Usually most of the stocks that I buy, comp is 80 plus. Uh, if, if a stock has three quarters of EPS accelerating um, acceleration, I need that in that stock. I see that in markets, maybe you can, you know, there's a filter there, you can add that in there. Um, price of stocks, I want it to be over 15. ETF is a different story. On the average, my sweet spot zone is stocks over $50. And those are my, all my best trades tend to be around like, you know, 40 or higher, some cases 30 or higher. Uh, ETF, again, is a different story. Uh, you know, if I'm doing triple leverage ETFs, um, those are very different type of trades. Um, but it needs to be liquid. Uh, but um, yeah, so I like to be at, at a certain price. There's a minimum. If I'm going through my list, that would be the minimum filter. Uh, these days I'm doing 20, 15 is where the line is drawn and set. RS line strength, our performance of strength instantly gravitates me towards it. If I see a stock doing that, I'm already eyeing it. That's instant. Um, and then probably other things are there too. Price. I don't want some like one dollar stock or something. I don't touch that. EPS higher the better, seventy five or higher. Uh, stock has to be in the market Smith list that I'm looking at based on my time horizon. It needs to be there. Now then, now I look at VCP characteristics before I'm buying it because, as I said, Mark's work. Is, I'm really trying to trade like him. Uh, when I was on the MPA, I take some time off from MPA just because my workload wasn't sinking in with the classes. But I'm 
should be back on from next month. I would find trades before he would put his list up because I wanted to be in those stocks because I want to do my own homework. I just, that's the way I always was. Uh, I, I have to do my own homework. I'm that type of trader. I have to do my work. And if I see a same stock Mark has, I have, I'm, I'm, I kind of know, oh, we both are looking at the same thing. And usually it's very cool because when we're buying, that's how, you know, um, I like to do my work. It's just, um, it's a habit. Um, I don't want a shortcut. Um, but uh, the NPA platform is excellent. I love it. I put all my trades on there. Give me amazing trade analytics. Um, it's very cool when I see the same stock both of us have. And I, those are the trades I'm kind of aggressive when I, when I do that. Um, all right, some USIC 2020 trades. Um, oh, this is DKNG, actually, the first one. Sorry, the name. Oh, Neo, never mind. Neo is, it is. So I bought this um, in the competition on 824, 2020, 1476. Look, look at that VCP right there while it's coming down. Pivot right there, bought it on that break and sold it on the way up for 25% gain in how many days? Three days. Is it three? Yeah. I, I had, I have to turn over in this competition. I wanted to ride longer, but I'm at a situation, I'm seeing patients, I, I have to lock profits. I'm in this competition. My entire goal was to beat Mark's performance. That was my entire goal. Uh, I didn't expect the pandemic to happen. Um, I didn't expect any of this to happen, but you're trading under fire. You've got to lock your profits. My risk reward on this trade, I was buying here, my stock was right like below the intraday low. That's how tight I was trading. Um, and I was trading size because this is the managed money. So talk about stress, but you know, great game. I have to lock. I have to move on. The, the, the straight uh, Lily I bought, um, again, I know that's uh, 728, uh, L.E. Lily. I, um, I bought it right above this pivot uh, cheap area. 50 day, I was using a 50 day, you know, trying to just get a trade. But look at the mistakes here. The RS line is low, you know, and this was, I knew this was a flag, but I saw this trade came on my list. Let me trade it. Okay, it's there. And then boom, instant sell. Just the entire time I was, you know, this is a mistake I did. I didn't pay attention to the RS line. Look at this one. Uh, look at the RS line on this. It's already turning up. So that's an oversight on that trade I did. And I was like, ah, what up? It was, yeah, it was two days waste of time, but that's pointless loss. I didn't need to have that. But it happens, you know? Um, and look, the news comes. Look at that. How, how we should just trade off the Burns news. I did that years ago off the cover of a, they had a cover and I traded off of it. I actually went the opposite direction when the cover showed up. So that's a different story. Some other trades for you guys. DKNG, I did multi-trades on this one in back-to-back -back fashion. Uh, 914, uh, 919, 25%. Went back in a few days later at 20, uh, 925. Sold it in 20, um, a few days later, 14. So these were compounded positions back-to-back. -back. Size were bigger on this one versus this. Um, and then I did frog, 15%. Um, I'm using some intraday tactics, but this should be a pretty good chart. And SQQ was a loss, uh, bought it, and then market opens after the weekend, and boom. So that was a bad call. Um, you can see how fast I was trading. So I hope these examples help, Richard. You know, if someone wants to pull up the market spin down the road, you guys can play through this. Yeah, I, I like all the homework assignments you're giving everybody. Yeah. All right, now let's move to basic time management strategies. Now, since I'm in a leadership role, and, and it's a extremely important. Uh, I know for a lot of people who are uh, messaging me on Twitter, they can't see the market. Look, you have to see the market 9.30 to 10.15 a.m. I wish I can see till 10.45, but I'm actually on the road at 10 o'clock. So, and trying to beat traffic. Um, but, so I technically really get half an hour, but have to see the market. Um, there's, I, you know, these days, there's a lot of activities happen. Some breakouts happen right at that first 30 minutes. And that's your entry right there. You can't avoid it. You have to see the market. You have phones, you have iPads. Everyone has 5G is insanely fast. Have the toys now. Um, last training hour, you have to make time. At least see from 3 to 4. If not, 3.30 to 4 p.m. is a must if you can. 
Friday is mandatory or a last trading day before a holiday. Um, the last I mean, the or Fridays, if you want to do more of a weekly trader, Friday is absolute mandatory. When I was doing canceling trading directly uh, by the owning style, Friday was the day I really uh, made the moves because I prefer weekly charts. So because they will recover and I will get a better entry. And, and uh, so Friday was a fantastic day. Uh, for me to see the recovery. Um, alerts on your phone, desktop should be required. All the tools do it. TC, my TC2000 sends me email, text messages. My watch goes off. All things in, in the office, everyone's seeing one of those ringing happening on your laptop. You know, I have alerts, audible alerts. You gotta place your alerts. And yeah, I have multiple pro uh, uh, programs. So if TC2000 is not uh, impactful, I have uh, Think or Swim uh, sending me alerts. And I also have eSignal doing it. Um, you have to have, if you can't see the screen, you've got to plan for alerts. Uh, and I always place my stops as soon as the market goes live. I don't leave it uh, hanging there um, because I don't want pre-market action. Um, as soon as the market goes up at 9.30, I'm placing all my stops in. No question asked. Uh, and they stay there if they're executed. Um, that's mandatory. I will not place a trade without a stop. If I'm buying, there's a stop. Next day, the next day, the stop that hasn't hit and the stop expires, I place another stop. Um, so I keep a track, you know, at all times and they're always entered because I can't see the market screen. So I know these are basic strategies, but this is how I'm trading. You know, so if you've got to play around on these few pointers. Any questions, Richard, on this? I think there's going to be some questions about when do you actually place your executions? Is it usually, you know, that, that first 30, 45 minute block? Oh, order, order of breakout. Yeah. So let's say if a breakout happens, I'm, or, uh, I would do a buy stop order. Uh, I find, okay, let's, uh, I'll pull up a chart. Um, let me go back here. Okay, right here. Let's say this is, uh, what is it? Uh, 1450 and the stock hasn't broken out yet. And I know this is a resistance where I wanted to buy. So I would actually place a buy stop order, uh, activate, um, you know, 1455, buy this many shares, um, you know, just activate it, you know, if I, if it didn't break out. Because if I'm driving and, and, and this time it did happen, um, I had my orders placed in, price goes up and I give a little bit wider room um, it just needs to activate the stock price. I'm not putting a limit order in. I'm doing a buy market order at this price. So if it breaks out, let's say it goes up 20, 30 cents higher, that's fine. I'll pay premium for it. I just need to get the position in where the pivot is. Uh, and there is slippage at times it happens, um, but but that's how I place my orders in. Perfect. And there is also a question about, and I think we should stick on that NEO example, if you can go back to that. Uh, where you usually place your stop, what percentages, and is it an end of day stop or is it live, you know, intraday as well? So as soon as I buy the order in, I already know where the stop is. And my average, my stop is, so let's say on this NEO, when I bought this trade, uh, I was pretty much being very aggressive. My stop was the last of, is, uh, my stop was 3% from where I'm buying it. Because that's on the average, I want my stops to be that tight. Because I was trading size, and I don't want to go more than that. So it was a percentage stop. Um, so I broke the order in two steps. I had it at three percent, and then one just below here. So fifty percent of the position sells at three percent, and then one a day before uh, the previous day's low. If because I don't think it's that big of a wide jump here, so it was, it was reasonable. Now, if the previous day's low is more than ten percent, then I won't keep it that wide. Um, it's, it's usually is intraday or I'll do 3%. That's on the average, my losses are around 2.97 to 3%. Um, that's how aggressive I like. That's where my, sometimes it goes to four, maximum five. Uh, I've already unloaded most of the position. It depends on the strong market, but in a choppy market like this, it's going to be less than 3% or maximum three. Perfect. And so is it, do you usually kind of break it down like that, a percentage stop as well as like a, a technical level that you're watching? Yeah, I do both. I do both. It depends on the stock that I'm trading and based on my time horizon. Let's say I'm, I got some time in the morning or let's say I'm Friday, you know, I, um, I'm able to see the market longer. Yeah. Then you not place it accordingly, but the stop is always placed. There's no, there's no position without a stop. If that makes any sense. I already know where the stop is because I do the homework 
before the market opens, you know. So uh, I'm already looking at the charts where I want to place a stop, where I want it, you know, if it goes here, I need to be out. Um, like in this example, it's a really good example here. Let's say you place a stop. Let's say you just do it above, below the 10-day uh, moving average. Let's say, let's say, just for example, you know, let's say it's below it. So you just place the order below the 10-day moving average, end of story, you know. So it just comes down, exits you out. There's really nothing to it. Um, but it's always planned. I don't guess my stop in the market. You know, I already know where I'm placing the stop, you know. In fact, if, if you're a new trader, you should look at the chart and say where my stop is, then place the buy. Because you need to know where your stop is. Um, not knowing your stop is, is the recipe for disaster. Um, because, you know, like in this case, the stop was the 50 day, because I did buy it here and the stop was the red lines. As soon as it came or I got, you know, slippage happened. So that's why it happened, because this happened in, in real time. I, I think it got down in the morning, so I had no choice, but it was the first order out. It was a first order out. I didn't care. I need to be out. So there you have it. Um, so this is really good examples. Um, give you some good idea how aggressive I was trading. Yeah, and Anish, just letting you know, we've got about 10 minutes left. So probably we okay. should try to focus on yeah. you know, the most important stuff. Yep, yep. Uh, so I won't do the deep dive on Palo Alto. We'll do it at a different meetup. I've got two more slides after this. Noise reduction. You have to control the noise around the stock. All market homework should be done prior to opening the markets. Control the use of Twitter social media for stock advice. I, I, I'm not saying no to social media, but you do have to control who you're listening to and what they're selling because someone's always selling, especially when the Bitcoin stuff. I mean, we have people giving you Bitcoins if you give this and that. I mean, come on, they're unloading it to retail. You have to understand this. This is in Livermore's book, 100 years ago, talks about this. You have to know when the public is being sold and you cannot think like a retail trader. You've got to think like a hedge fund manager. You've got to think like a professional. You have to understand this. Tools of the trade. Get a paid charting tool. You pay for what you get. I don't trust the free tools, so you pay for something. Look, you're going to invest in yourself if you want to make it in the market. Invest in your tools. Invest in yourself. Attend trading workshops. You know, you have to go to school just like you go to college or professional college education. Trading also has... You know, there's not few players are doing excellent work. You know, I would see that Mark's doing excellent work, Turtle Lines doing excellent work. Attend them, learn. Uh, for me, Market Smith's the must tool. I traded um, for many years. All I had was Market Smith. And, you know, get a color printer. If you want an inkjet, I would say Epsom EcoTank printers are excellent. You can do 20,000 pages on, on $30 worth of ink. Get a ruler, get color pens and pencils and treat trading as a business, not hobby. That's key. If you treat it as a hobby, you're gonna get paid as a hobby, which, pays, which makes you make nothing, you just spend on your hobby. But get these tools. Reason is, you gotta print your charts. You've got to print your charts on different size of paper if you can. Marcus Smith can do the large format the IBD is known for. Uh, if not, just, do, just print it out. Turn off the screen, take the chart, mark your buys and sells, with color pens and pencils. O'Neill did it. I copied that style of approach to my work. Study the stock patterns on paper. You, you will start to go up an edge. You know, iPads, that's fine. Print the damn chart. You need to see it away from your screens. And then you need to just, your mind has to look at the paper. There's the reason I'm saying pen and pencil is because I learned a strategy from uh, Robin Sherman's leadership uh, conference. Like he, he always says, take a pen and uh, write your stuff down. Your brain picks up, uh, your neural pathways are created when you're using your hands uh, and, and not on the, it doesn't work on the iPad. You need pen and paper, that friction, and your brain is thinking differently. You have to see these are tactics that I learned at a, at a leadership conference that I'm employing it on trading. A um, little bit of old school methodology is needed. If you feel bad about printing, plant some trees. I've killed so many laser printers, destroyed printers, because I printed, I don't know, I've lost count on how much I've printed on, on from my uh, Have to do this. Uh, if you look at some O'Neill's charts on some of his book, he has fully annotated charts. That's how he was able to push his edge. Um, so we have the tools, print. Uh, so we'll, oh, Richard, we'll, we'll do this at, a, at, at um, 
at the next meetup event, this portion of the presentation, because this is very long. Yes. So, is that cool? Yeah, that sounds good. Um, then we've just got time for a few questions. Uh, yeah. First things first, I'd love to kind of hear what general advice you have for traders uh, during this time. So, you know, they can set them set themselves up for success come the next bull market and, and try to shoot for that triple digit year. Yeah. Uh, look, when the market's down, everyone's down, this is the time to do homework. In fact, you're going to have stocks, um, you know, let me pull up Marcus Smith really quick. Mm -hmm. uh, pull up Marcus Smith. You're going to have excellent stocks, um, which are going to be the next leaders because uh, I don't know if you read between the lines of even Mark's tweets, even he's looking at the next leaders because you're going to have, uh, look, look at this. If you're focused, you could be buying this industry straight. Now, I'm not saying this is a leader, but look at the RS line. You're going to have new stocks, new new leadership. Um, you know, when the market's down, look, start finding the stocks which are up. I mean, we can just go here. Are you seeing my Marcus Smith, Richard? Yeah, I am. Okay. Well, I'll just make it really quick. Let's just go here. Here's the report. So, okay. All right, just look at this list. All right, just go this. I'm not even gonna look at that. Now, if you're doing your homework, look at this. Just pivot right there. Boom. I'm not. I'm just looking at the RS line. Just looking at the RS line. Let's do a weekly chart. It makes it even better. Look at the RS line. That's all I'm doing. Mark is down. This stock's up. What is it? Medical services. Go to the next stock. Look at that. You know, you want to look at the new stuff. Um, and there will be new leadership. It's every market. That's why I give 2009 examples on, on the, when you play the replay. Those charts, those stocks were forming when the market was, the world thought the world is going to end in 2009. And those stocks were about to take off. Um, and that is where, in fact, the best rates come out of this uh, time period. The best rates. I mean, look at this. I mean, just look at this. I mean, look at that. I mean, obviously, I won't be trading a dollar stock, but eh, I'm just giving you an example. Something's going on. Just, I'm just going to this list. Look, it's automatic. I'm not doing anything. I'm just, weren't people talking about this? Richard, didn't you bring this up on last week? Yep. Look at that. This is new leadership right there. Look at that. The stock goes from in, in the 20s, is now in the 70s range. If this is not a leader, then I don't know what is, because this is, this is a character change. This is now ultra institutional quality stock. Um, look, um, this is twenty dollars stock. Now this is seventy dollars stocks. This is where this stock has room to go up. I mean, I don't know the future, but this is ball. This is this is institution buying. You know, uh, this is how this is how the game is played. Um, just look at the RS line. I mean, this is a yeah. You know, I'm not saying you go you now. Let, let's see what happens on on, on Monday, but I'm just saying um, stocks set up in bad markets focus on the leaders. Leaders are always going to lead uh, because money has to rotate. Uh, and that's why, as I said, I keep talking about leaders because that you have to think like a leader. Um, let me show you something good example here. Okay, let me show you this example. Okay. Now, let me explain to you. I'm not, I'm going to diss this company because it's not the stock price. There's a lot of things happen in a company when this is happening. It's leadership issues. I'll give you a very good example. I get an email from Facebook that my Oculus account now can be detached from Facebook account. Originally, it was detached. They forced me to add my Facebook. Now they say they can't. What a confusion they're going through because there are other issues going on. You know, leadership thinking involves in stocks and how you think as a whole. I know this is more psychological stuff, but it all plays so if you're a leader, you have to think how to think, how to get this straight and how to avoid this. You know, this is, they're, they're having issues, right? Now. This is massive downtrend, but focus on new stocks, you know, leaders. Uh, this is biotech, look, biotech, look, look at that sector right there. Let's just pull up the sector chart. Okay, sector's not there. I mean, sector charts are different, but just look at the stocks. Hey, and Anish, unfortunately we're out of time, yeah. but uh, yeah. yeah, I completely agree with all that you're showing. Just yeah. focus on the leaders, wait for that setup, and, and we just got to execute. So, um, yeah, any last, uh, you know, quick bits of advice? Uh, no, for we will uh, uh, do a part two for this, for the for the in-depth model study on, on a meetup event, Richard. But thank yep. you for uh, having me on there. I know I had to present a lot for this material. 
I had to gauge, uh, but thank you everyone for giving me the opportunity to speak and associating me with some amazing speakers that I've looked up to and I can't believe today is the day that I'm presenting. Can't wait to do this in person uh, because I love being on stage. So, but thank you, Richard. Thank you, Trader Line. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you, Anish. And uh, we'll be right back with Christian from Hertz talking about how to trade in this environment and also trading edges. So we'll be right back and I'll start at 2.40. So I'll see you there. Mm -hmm. 